So uh, this is not a traditional uh, uh, conference talk. So we wanted to kind of provide an update to what our special interest group is working on. Uh, and then after that update, we want to talk to you guys and understand the scenarios that you guys want to bring to Windows, uh, some of the use cases, figure out how many of you guys are running containers in production of Windows, what your roadmap is going to look like, as well as give you an opportunity to make asks to the community, uh, as well as you know, we'll come back and ask you guys to come and get involved, uh, come and help us test this, uh, write some features, or write documentation. So um, we're a fairly small SIG compared to uh, every other SIG in the Kubernetes community. So uh, the more people that come and join us, the more customer voice that we have there, it's going to make it easier for us to kind of push through some of these features and make this a reality. I'm Michael. Uh, I work for uh, VMware. I was formerly at Apprenda. Um, I kind of started this SIG uh, a few years ago and uh, took us through the journey of bringing us to where we are today. And for the past couple of years, Patrick uh, from Microsoft has been uh, my co-chair and we've been working together to, uh, um, to kind of make true on our investments uh, in the Windows ecosystem for Kubernetes. So, um, so let's get started here. Like I mentioned, to we'll do a few community effort updates, kind of make you guys aware of the progress we've made and where we are today. And then we'll move on uh, to a discussion in Q&A. So starting in early 2016, we kind of formed the SIG with a singular uh, effort to be around bringing Windows Server and Windows Server containers into Kubernetes. Our goal was never to substitute the entire control plane of Kubernetes into Windows, but more importantly, to bring Windows Server as a compute node to Kubernetes. So all of your master components are still going to run on Windows but you'll be able to have both Windows as well as Linux compute nodes working together for your applications. Um, when we formed the SIG, Apprenda and Red Hat were the, the first contributors, and we kind of took it all the way to Alpha uh, in December of 16, here in Seattle, actually. Um, and that was basically, think of this as a proof of concept that was, that was there to kind of rally the troops, show what was possible, and we were able to bring a lot more folks from the community to come and join us so that we could continue towards our beta that was a year later uh, in December of 17. And with the beta, we had true capabilities on Windows with Kubernetes. So you could have storage, you could have networking, and we had a couple of uh, CNI plugins like OVN and OVS that were already working. And then we also had a lot more feature-rich capabilities from the container subsystem that Microsoft was providing with Docker. So you guys could start testing your workloads, start bringing applications into Windows, and making that uh, possible to test. And then fast forward to one year later and where we are today. Yeah. OK, there we go. Yeah, and so so basically, like over the last year, um, you know, Microsoft has put out two different uh, what they're calling semi-annual channel releases of Windows Server. But that what we were doing was working with the community to find the areas where Windows was lacking, and we needed to do things like improve the storage and networking support. And so we did that basically in concert with a few different Kubernetes releases. So if you look at, I think it was build either 1.9 or 1.10, we got secrets working, and then if you look at what we did with Windows Server 2000, or sorry, 1803 and later, we started to get things like Simlinks working. And so basically filling in a lot of those capabilities that Kubernetes needed to be able to work well, we had to make changes to the OS and then you know, got those lined up with the Kubernetes releases. And so you know, all those changes really kind of came together in our first long-term release, which was Windows Server 2019, which is what we're recommending as like the viable platform um, for this stuff going forward. And um, there's still more, more, more improvements happening to work um, better with some of the different network plugins, um, like the stuff around Calico and, and Flannel. Um, do you have that on the next slide? Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, but you know, it's basically kind of a com combined effort between you know fixing the closed source stuff and then improving the open source stuff at the same time to make to make this work. And so. That's why it's it's so important that you know if you're looking at using this in your group, that you you know you, you meet with us in the SIG meetings and you help us explain how you want to set this stuff up and deploy it because there's so many different ways people are are putting things together on Linux and we need to figure out what the right set is that's going to work 
best between the Windows and the Linux environment. Because, you know, as we already mentioned, the goal is not to, you know, re replace Linux or something. The goal is to have an environment that really lets you run all your apps in one place. So. In addition to that, Kubernetes is almost infinitely customizable, right? There's so many features. If there's some of the Kubernetes features are more important to you, you can actually raise a priority so that you can actually think about start working on them first. Uh, at a high level, we're trying to enable pretty much all of the core capabilities of Kubernetes, and most of them do work. But there are certain features here and there that you know we just never had the bandwidth to go and explore. So having more folks that are interested in some of those features come and help us. You know, we'll help you help us, we'll help you. So um, when the 1.13 release train was going on, our initial ambition was to go stable with 1.13. Uh, due to a variety of reasons, some of it is testing stability. We had to port a lot of our testing infrastructure uh, to, uh, to the Kubernetes CI engine. We just didn't make the cut. So our current planned release is with 1.14 in March of 2019. Now that's not a done deal. There, there's still some risk in us getting GA at that release, which is why we're asking you know, more folks of you guys to come and join us. That way we'll make that uh, increase the likelihood of that happening. So what's some of the committed work that we have? So our first and foremost commitment is that you'll be able to put Windows Server nodes into Kubernetes and you'll be able to schedule Windows Server containers. That is the promise that we're making if we were going to go to GA. And that's going to work well, it's going to be scalable, and it's going to be reliable. Hyper-V isolation is still in alpha, so we're strictly talking about Windows Server containers. If you want to use Hyper-V isolated containers, you have a limitation of one container per pod, and it's still in alpha, so you know, be aware if you're, if you're trying that scenario. On the networking side, uh, Flannel, Host Gateway, and VXLAN will be available uh, by that target time frame. OVN and OVS uh, will be available, as well as WinBridge and WinOverlay. Uh, those are kind of the, the new generation of the WinCNI and where that effort has transitioned to. And then you'll be able to do layer three networking using top of rack switches. So that's our committed work. This is where we have members of the SIG that have committed in doing some of this work. Um, some of the work that's still under design right now but haven't really committed resources include the group managed service accounts. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with that feature, that is the ability to provide an identity for a container running on Docker on Windows so that that container can access external resources like a file share or a database and have an identity that can be authenticated and authorized against. And then hybrid cluster uh, support. That kind of has a couple of different uh, items under it. So there's the runtime policies that we need to work on, the conformance profile for Windows, as well as the hybrid cluster support. So let me explain a couple of these. Um, the hybrid cluster support is, is important because today Kubernetes, even though the master components are going to run on Linux, the compute nodes have to be only a single operating system. So the compute nodes can either be Windows only or Linux only. And we're working with the community to make sure that um, the SIG cluster lifecycle and some of the other SIGs that are, that are responsible for that area that will be able to have in production a hybrid cluster where master components are on Linux, and then your compute nodes are a combination of Linux and Windows that can accept workloads from customers that have requirements across both operating systems. And the other part is runtime policies. So we're, uh, that's kind of a new thing that's coming into uh, the Kubernetes community, and we're working with, with the team to ensure that if you have a workload that's either Windows or Linux, you don't need to go and put all the magic sauce inside your pod specifications and your YAML files to kind of indicate where your workload needs to land. Uh, there has to be some smartness in the cluster that can identify, hey, this is a Windows workload landed on a Windows node, and this is a Linux workload running on a, on a Linux uh, Docker container. So um, we're looking for folks from our community, potentially some of you guys, to come in and help us navigate this and make sure that the right investments are made in runtime policy to, uh, to make this a reality for Windows as well. So post-GA, 
and you know I, we mentioned 1.15 plus there there is no real target time frame because these are so far out but some of the things that we're, uh, we're going to work on is Microsoft has been putting a lot of investments around the CRI and container D implementation and that's something that we want to see light up for, for Windows. Um, the Hyper-V isolated containers is something that we definitely want to bring out to, to stable and GA release as well. And we have a ton of partners and, cus and customers that are interested in both Caligo and other storage and network providers and we're working with them to, to release those on uh, Kubernetes as well. And the last is, you know, daemon sets. So as you guys are familiar, there's no privilege mode on Windows. So a lot of the daemon sets that are out there, they kind of require that, that, that I access to the host operating system. So we're working to figure out how can we enable daemon sets for Windows with some of the restrictions that exist in the operating system. Patrick, anything you want to add on? On this? No, I'm, I mean, I think that's that's pretty much it right now. Um, in terms of the what we've been putting the most effort in recently over the last month, it's really been around bringing a lot of the tests online. And so if you start looking over at Test Grid, you'll see that we've got some results that are running on Azure. We're still in the process of like tweaking those test flows. But tomorrow, we're actually meeting with the uh, con uh, conformance working group, specifically around defining um, what basically how we're going to test and communicate Windows support because it's something that's going to be optional. Not all customers are going to use it, but we want to make sure that the conformance testing still sort of validates the quality of your Kubernetes deployment overall. And then they're probably going to add another profile that says, and here's Windows as an additional feature. So that way you can make sure that it's working well regardless of what cloud you're going to run it on. And so we're basically trying to get that right baseline of, of tests set. And this is something that's relatively, I mean, this, this is a new, a new development for Kubernetes conformance. So um, there's going to be a lot of, and that, that's going to be where, we're, where personally I'm spending most, most of my time over the next couple months um, getting that done because that way we can make sure that you've got the quality you need to run this in production. So. Yeah, so if we were to look at our priorities, number one priority is getting all our tests and all the investments we've already made to be super stable. So a lot of the new development needs to take a backseat to getting everything stable. Yeah. Uh, without stability and, and passing all the tests, you know, we can't really release. So. so the last few slides here. So we'll give you guys an update on Flannel because I know a lot of you guys are interested in that. So you know, when we're looking at it from a production standpoint, most of you guys have given us feedback that you know you want uh, a CNI that's going to be supported both on Windows as well as Linux, and something that you're already working with. And Flannel seems to be uh, uh, the obvious choice that we heard from you guys. So host gateway support in Flannel for Windows uh, just got released a few days ago. Uh, so that's out there. It is it, it is working. You can go ahead and start testing it, and we'll have a few, uh, a few partners like Rancher that already um, uh, released support for this with Windows Server containers. Uh, on the VXLAN front, uh, that work is underway. Um, the team is uh, working on the validation and the last few things that are needed before they start you know, doing their end-to-end -end testing. And, and, uh, and the goal there is to merge the PRs sometime in the middle of the first quarter of next year. So if you're looking at the timeline, when we go GA, we will have Flannel, both VXLAN and Host Gateway supported. Now, there are some updates to Windows Server 1903 that are going to make Flannel better. Um, there are some bugs that we've encountered uh, around uh, leaking endpoints and DNS propagation and, and some scalability uh, items around the subnet config. The team is aware of those, uh, and Microsoft is doing a great job of educating us on every step of the way what they're working on. So a lot of these are going to be updated in 1903. Now, we understand that Server 19 is the long-term servicing release, and a lot of you guys might want to adopt that. So Microsoft is going to work on backporting some of these uh, bugs and features back into 19. Now, that's not a committed thing, but you know, they're, you know, we're, we're working with them and making sure that the long-term servicing branch of Windows has all the updates that are necessary for you guys to be able to run production-level workloads uh, with Flannel. Okay. Yeah, so um, 
so for those of you that haven't tried uh, deploying anything yet on Windows, um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was um, sort of a couple of the, the things around the, uh, the experience of actually deploying things. So yesterday I had an entire session um, that, that uh, we've got a, there'll be a recording available for, and then I'll probably also post some, pull some of the specific demos out onto our SIG Windows YouTube channel because I've got a better screen recording off my laptop for that. Um, but, um, but in the labs yesterday, we basically went through showing what some of the considerations are that you needed to make as you're doing deployments. And so you know, today, if, um, whenever you've got things set up, you're always gonna have a mix of Windows and Linux nodes. So even if you're only using the Linux node for like the leader roles, like where you're gonna run your API server, um, scheduler and all, and all of those uh, typical uh, pods there, um, you're still gonna have the Windows nodes that are, that are running there. And so when you're deploying stuff, um, today you wanna be sure to use node selectors, which let you pick what operating system a deployment's gonna, gonna run on. Because if you try to deploy something like, you know, your ingress controller using Nginx, which is using a Linux container, and it inadvertently gets scheduled on a Windows node, well, that's not gonna work. And vice versa, if you've got the Windows app trying to run on a Linux node. And so, you know, the scheduler and Kubernetes API already has this capability called node selectors and taints that you can use to control where things are going to land. So, at a minimum, you wanna be using the node selectors on there. And if you're gonna experiment with adding just a few Windows nodes to an existing environment, you may also want to set a taint on those nodes as well. Because that way, if you've got existing deployments that are already there in the cluster that might, you know, go from one node to another as things fail over, the taint would prevent the Linux applications from accidentally showing up on the Windows node. Um, but the taint can, can prevent that. And then so when you go and deploy your Windows application, you just put a node selector and a toleration in there and then it will still run on Windows just fine. But that's a way that you can you know, sort of segment the workloads out and make sure they run on the right OS. Um, Funny enough, uh, Robert from Ticketmaster is here. They were the first ones to kind of flag that out as an yeah. issue uh, way back when. So uh, it works now a little bit differently, but it does work. Yeah. And, and so you know, we're, we're looking for, for thoughts on ways on how we might be able to improve that. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the possible ways to do it would be to use an admission controller that, looked, that basically analyzed what the image was and then base added these for you. And so I think that's something that's technically feasible, um, but the trade-off there would be if you're doing a whole lot of small deployments, now you've got a whole lot of load over on this controller that's gonna have to make calls over the network over to your container registry to find out is this a Windows or a Linux image there. And so it, it, you know, these are the sorts of things where it's like if this is you know, something that you wanna help with, you know, we, would, we would love to have um, any help that's there because that's not a Windows development project, that's just requires some fluency you know, in, in the Kubernetes APIs and that application, uh, that admission controller, you know, could run on the existing Linux nodes today. Um, so a couple other things are, um, I know that I've seen some templates that people have, have used on Linux have really low memory limits of, you know, like one or 200 megs. That's not gonna work on Windows. Just to start a container, you're gonna need at least 300. And it's not that 300 megs are gonna all be in active use. It's that the Windows services, um, if, if they need to allocate that memory, they need to be able to, to go up to there. And if you set a limit too low, things will just start crashing. And so in the examples that I pasted, that I've got from my session, I had relatively low um, requests of like one or 200 megs, but I was raising the limits up to, you know, the 600 to 800 meg, meg range to make sure that the um, applications could run. And, you know, that's not, memory that's all allocated up front, it's just if the application needs it, 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 can, it can use it. So the resource constraints still work, you just need to raise them up a bit because of the Windows background services running in those uh, containers. Um, then the last thing is, um, you know, historically, Windows implemented a lot of the APIs that people could call from user mode in kernel mode. And that is very different from Linux because in Linux, um, you know, if there's one thing that Linus Torvalds did right, it's he stabilized the syscall interface very, very early and fought off anybody that wanted to change those. 
And what and, and that's giving you you the benefit of, well, you know, most applications aren't going to crash if you change your kernel version. But unfortunately, nobody in the in in the Windows team had 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 designed that early on. And so the user mode applications need to be able to run on the same kernel that they were built on. So if you build your container on a Windows Server 2019 machine, it needs to run on a Windows Server 2019 machine. And if you're using an older version like 1709 or 1803, the same, the same is true. And so that's why the Hyper-V isolation is going to be so important for us to finish because that's going to allow you to update your Windows nodes first, but then it will just bring up the kernel for the container that needs it at that older version. So that's gonna give you that backwards compatibility so you can move the Windows nodes forward even if your apps haven't been um, rebuilt in containers yet. Basically until that happens, if you guys do have a need to run multiple versions of the OS, you know, obviously what, what we recommend and what Microsoft is recommending is Windows Server 2019 should be both your container host as well as your images as one of the, the most stable platform. It's the most feature rich, and that's the one that we're gonna go GA with. But if you have other needs, then the taints and tolerations that uh, Patrick mentioned earlier is the best way to match the OS image of the host to the OS image of your containers. That way they land to the right spot. So cool. All right, there. so we, uh, we can move into some Q&A, but right, right before we start that, I just want to get a, a, a quick survey out. So how many of you guys are running Windows containers in production today, irrespective of what's your orchestrator? Any of you guys? Uh, someone in there. All right, how about pre-production? Or like, you know, testing and, and validating. Okay, I love you guys. How many of you guys are using Kubernetes with Windows containers in, the, in that same ecosystem? A few guys, so awesome. Uh, we'd love to actually see you guys uh, in the SIG as well. Uh, we'd love to see you guys in the SIG as well. Come in, tell us your experiences, bugs you guys are finding, issues that you guys have, and maybe we'll give you some work back as well. So we're, we're uh, yeah, so let's start some questions. Uh, I think that the images in the Windows container have been optimized more than initially, but the speed is still slower than the Linux container. Can I use features like feature on demand, FODB2, or can you speed up image downloading? So, so the question was, which features can you use inside the containers? And then image downloading speeds. And the image download speeds, okay. Yeah, so one of the things we did for the image download speeds is if you look at the containers that Microsoft is publishing for Windows Server 2019 and later, we actually moved them onto another service. Um, if you go and look at Docker Hub, it's going to say the command's going to be docker pull mcr.microsoft.com. And so that particular service is replicated in more regions than Docker Hub was initially. And it's also gonna be available in some of the sovereign clouds. So you, if you're like in the, the China market and you're using Azure there, that's gonna be available there as well. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is focus on improving the CDN to get some of those download speeds because I've seen people that were in you know, Latin America downloading from the US East Coast server and that did not go well. Um, so you know, fixing the infrastructure is one thing that we've, we've done to improve the speed there. The other thing we've done is if you look at version by version, we've been chopping down the size of those images pretty considerably. If you look at the Windows Server 2016 and like extract it with tar, there were actually duplicate files in there. And that was because the way that the file system layout worked, it couldn't do sim links on the fly as it was extracting it. We fixed that in half the image size in Windows Server, I think it was 1709 or 1803, and then we trimmed out even more 
files that were not needed for um, server um, 2019. And so I think the download over the last couple of years has, has gone from something like five gigs down to, what are we at, 1.6 gigs. Um, and so you know, we're continuing to, to, to tw move that down further. Nano server is a lot smaller, but of course it's because everything's been ripped out, a lot of the APIs that you're used to may not work there in nano server. And so I think we'll be able to get a little bit more, but in terms of the download, um, the download and on disk size for like server core, I think it's probably not going to be another like order magnitude drop. We're going to be seeing you know a few more percent um, here and there, and then hope that the infrastructure um, improvements help with that as well. And there's a couple of other points on that. So if you're using a public cloud provider, obviously with their own registries, yeah. then you know the locality there will help. Um, if you guys have heard the announcements, Harbor, the registry, is now a CNCF project. So we'll be working with them to make sure that the Windows support is, is, is top notch. So what that means is if you want a hosted registry on premise near to where you're deploying your Kubernetes cluster, you'll be able to get locality uh, for, your, uh, for your network speed and, and yeah. downloading those images. Yeah, and that's also going to be important if you want to run in a, in a completely separated network as well. You can install a registry there, download the stuff once, and then push it in there. So two-part question. What's sort of a realistic projected date for AKS supporting Windows nodes? Um, you'd have to speak to the AKS pro project managers. So this, all the stuff that I've been doing my demos on is open source, and it's available as part of the ACS engine project. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot of people that are using that for their pre-production environments. But you know, when they're ready to you know, say we're gonna, we're gonna support it and have enough people when you call up on the phone, like that's, that's, I, that's not part of the process I'm in. Uh, I was second part of the question is, so you talked about nano server and server core. Yeah. What about the Windows container image? Yeah, so that one was added in Windows Server 2019. It's more like what's in the Windows 10 client. And so I've talked to some people that are doing things like game servers where they need a little bit of DirectX APIs. You know, they're not you know, doing full GPU rendering, but they may need to calculate some 3D meshes and things like that. And that, that can work in that new Windows image that's available. And is that something that's at preview or is that at production right now, which one? Okay, yeah, so, it's, so I think that one went out with server 2019 as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's in the same container registries, um, but that has a little bit more capability. So if you're looking at things where you need to be able to use more of the Windows um, DirectX or other rendering APIs to do things like document conversion, that's what that image is really tailored for. But it, if you're not using those things specifically, I would recommend using server core just because it's quite a bit smaller. That other image is, again, like, I don't know, four gigs or something. It, it's at least double the size of server core. In terms of update, it'll be at the same time. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Nano server, server core, and the Windows image are all going to be updated um, for every security update. Has, some, has something been uh, ripped out, out of the Windows container image uh, compared to the Windows 10 OS? Um, the last time, because I talked to Taylor, he said that it's the exact same thing, but I feel there are some things missing. Yeah, so I don't work on that image specifically. Um, I mean, I, that's something that my, I, I would hope would be in the Microsoft docs. Is that? Uh, like around the user, uh, users, uh, basically, there's a little bit of uh, inconsistencies, like how you provision uh, users and how you manage using uh, window, uh, PowerShell, Windows PowerShell experience. I think just to add to that, we've had some issues using like DSC inside some of those images, especially around provisioning local Windows user accounts um, and such things. Uh, I mean, honestly, raised Microsoft support cases on those. Okay. So. Hi. Um, I have a few questions, actually. Um, one of those, of those is uh, you mentioned the lack of support for um, uh, multi containers per pod uh, on Windows, right? Well, th that's with Hyper V isolation today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you're not running Hyper V isolation, you can run multiple containers per pod. All and right. That's, and that's the default today. So, okay, okay. So, but, but now the direction is mostly to go with Hyper V. 
the future because it's the way that you mentioned with the, the major version yeah. things. Okay, so if you want sidecars, we can do that with the other mode now, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if they're all the same version, you can you can do that today. Okay. Uh, that other question is uh, regarding the let's say uh, pod pod communication between uh, Linux and Windows nodes. Mm -hmm. um, so so if we wanted to deploy Flannel with VXLAN. Uh, uh, on one side, we can have easily with CNI plugin and daemon set, we can deploy that on a Linux nodes, but on Windows, it's quite more complicated. Uh, what's the best approach to that with the lack of support with daemon set? Uh, are we supposed to bake that in the image or post provisioning scripts or whatever to? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, so the, I mean, the general approach is that you're, you still need to have a configuration management system on the Windows nodes. And whether you're doing that with something like PowerShell DSC or Ansible or, or whatever, whatever tools you want out there, or if you're just rebuilding images and redeploying them with Terraform, I mean, in all those cases, you're, still, you're going to need to be able to install your container runtime, you know, either Docker or Containerd. You're going to need to install a CRI plugin, or sorry, the CNI plugin and the Kubelet. And so like, I don't see that, that changing. You're, you're still going to need some way to manage those settings in those rollouts. Um, as far as daemon sets go, I, I, don't, I don't see that working on Windows. It's not a committed feature on the roadmap for daemon sets with privileged support. So if you just need something running on every node, like let's say you wanted to set up like a local caching server or something, that would work fine because it doesn't need privilege. But as far as actually, you know, being able to, to use um, containers as a distribution mechanism, for things that need um, full privilege to the host, um, it's not something that that's possible right now. Okay. okay. Uh, so, last quick question: uh, We were talking about speeding up the download of the images with CDN mm -hmm. caches and everything, or a local Docker registry. Actually, uh, I think that there's like some requirement right now with the base image from Windows to be hosted on the on the host uh, Microsoft servers, like the server core we, that we cannot cache locally? Like. No, you, you can cache them. The problem is that um, by default, it's set up to not push that to another server. There's a flag to override that. OK, so we can do yeah. that. But we use, it won't go against the licensing of you, the, the whole thing. So you, you can do that within your own environment. But what the default is that it won't. So what we're trying to do is avoid the worst case scenario where someone builds an image against Windows Server Core, adds a whole bunch of software to it, and then when they go and push to another registry, they have to upload all of the Server Core images. Because now all of a sudden they've got a, you know, a three gig upload instead of just uploading the delta, which may only be a few hundred megs. And so that, that's why we've got those separated out as foreign layers, so that way they actually go back to that CDN. If you need to push to a private repository in your environment, you can do that. There's, um, I can't remember if it's a client or if it's a Docker config flag, but you could set that and then you can override and push it into your private registry. So if you've, if you've got something like Docker, um, Docker Trusted Registry or Harbor or, or Likely Key, um, then, you'd, then you should be able to push to that and use that in your environment, and that's perfectly fine. We just try to block that behavior by default because we don't want people basically breaking the tree and always downloading everything. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, one more question. <laughs> I think I, the collaboration between the Windows Server team at MSFT and the Windows SIG team is not working well. Is there any problem? Uh, I think the VFP issue uh, about yeah, I earlier mentioned that I reported took quite, took quite a while to resolve. So, what's not going on between yeah. two between two teams? So, so you're talking about the the crashing issue you reported? Yes. Yeah, and and so the problem there is that when Windows needs a bug fix, it needs to go through Microsoft support because a developer is not allowed to write code and then send it out to someone to test because they want to make sure it's always being built in a secure data center and all of that. And so it, it can make things a little bit hard at times, and that's why it's, it's so important that 
you're engaged with the Microsoft technical account manager on this and working to escalate that and get it done because we have to basically make sure that all the right process is being followed, which is a little bit different from when, from, you know, you can distribute a Linux um, source code patch as a patch and people can build and deploy it. Um, and so you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get better at that and um, but getting the cases visible there will help get more people on the problem. So. I think that could be a very tough hurdle, but it goes very, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I pass the mess, uh, this mic. So, so let's do one more question and then. Um, uh, I think Deep had a clarification on an earlier one. And by the way, once we're done, we'll be outside, so you yeah. will we'll be able to answer more stuff. Hey, I had a quick comment on the daemon set uh, issue that was brought up. So one uh, potential uh, mechanism that we have explored is with the support for uh, name pipe mounting, uh, one thing we have tried is like be able to configure a daemon set and then have a very small sort of a host privilege proxy uh, that you bring up you know, through your uh, host uh, configuration mechanism to to have the daemon set container uh, basically delegate uh, some of the privileged operations to this uh, host process proxy. Uh, do you guys, or does anyone have a comment on why that may not work or things that would break? Uh, I mean, I think that would be a great one for us to explore in one of the SIG meetings. Okay. To, because if, if we could write down what the use cases for, were for it, then I think we could, could explore that further. But right. I, mean, I, I do think that if, 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 you, if that's the kind of thing that people could help develop, then that may solve some of these problems like distributing the CNI plugins and things like that. Correct. And so, I mean, I think there, there may be a te some technical feasibility there. Cool. I mean, the, the, there's also other things that, you know, yeah. smart things that could happen, right? For example, Envoy containers, uh, uh, sidecars could be there and do an authorized call, you know, maybe using certificate-based uh, authentication to a process that's running on the host and you'll be able to get host privileges that way. So there's a lot of things that someone could do to kind of delegate that access to something else. We just haven't had time to explore them. Uh, by the way, Deep has signed up very recently to help us on the managed service uh, accounts work. So if you guys are interested in that, you know, we're <laughs> putting him on the hook for that. Uh, all right, so one last question and then we'll go outside. Uh, I think we're out of time, so we'll be able to answer more questions outside, though. This last question, by is, uh, so building on the Hyper-V isolation, do you guys see a future for LCAL, Linux containers on Windows? So the use case scenario is sort of similar to Azure Notebooks and be able to run sort of both Linux and Windows containers on Windows host, leveraging Hyper-V isolation and, and using Kubernetes to orchestrate all that. I mean, I think it's something that, that would be technically possible but we would need to be um, very careful about how we approach it because right now the scheduler in, in Kubernetes is designed where you know each node can run only one thing, and you know so the common the idea of like well you know can this node run both you know AMD 64 and ARM 64 code, like technically somebody could do that today with QMU, but it's not something that the scheduler is designed to do. And so running multiple OSs on the same host is something where it's like, even though the container runtimes underneath may be able to do it, we would need to work very closely across a lot of groups like SIG architecture and SIG node to figure out, you know, how you would want to enable that scenario. Um, just because it's not something that, it's not something that we could do just within the scope of one SIG. It's something where you would need to build an engineering consensus across lots of groups and convince them that, that it's the right thing to do. And given that most, most people are working with cloud providers that make it very easy to add and remove nodes, then I would, I would think that they would be, um, it wouldn't be their top priority. Um, that, that's my, some of my concerns about it. But if someone had a really compelling use case for it, it's definitely something that someone could pick up and, and, and give a try. Um, so. You had a question? I guess just a quick question to the room. Is there here anybody interested in the all Windows clusters, control plane? Just want to judge interest before. No? Okay. All Windows clusters, control plane on Windows. So all the master components of Kubernetes running on Windows versus Windows. So looks like we got one person interested. <laughs> By the way, I've got a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, thank you for the few of you guys that are coming to our SIG and contributing. I see a few guys, Ben, uh, Peter, Deep. Thank you, and uh, you know, come and join us.